Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the fifth meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism uh, Committee. Uh, can I welcome uh, all members? Can I also welcome the committee's advisor uh, in relation to our export inquiry, Jane Gotts? Uh, and can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the sound equipment. Uh, item one on the agenda, uh, our members are content that we take items four and five in private. Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. Uh, item two uh, is uh, the uh, start, uh, I suppose, of our inquiry on internationalisation of Scottish uh, business. I'd like to welcome Ian McTaggart, uh, who is the General Manager and Company Secretary for the Scottish Council for Development and Industry. Welcome, Ian. Thanks for coming uh, along. Um, we've got uh, probably about an hour uh, with you, Ian, um, uh, to uh, go over uh, the questions the members uh, want to, to ask. Um, uh, uh, we've got your written submissions. I'm not intending to, to ask you to make an opening statement. We'll go straight into questions, if that's all right. And I can ask members, although we have some time, if we can keep the questions short and to the point and answers as, as short and to the point as possible would be helpful. That would just allow us to get through the range of topics we want to discuss in the time uh, that's available to us. I wonder if I could start, um, Ian, by, by asking about some of the uh, points made in the SCDI, SCDI submission around this question of um, collaboration between uh, government agencies, trade bodies and industry associations. And you know, there's a bit of a sense from some of the written submissions we've received that the, the landscape is somewhat cluttered. Um, there are different public bodies involved uh, in trying to provide support. Is it clear where the support's coming from? For example, the Federation of Small Business told us in their submission that when they surveyed, uh, four out of ten of their members believed it was difficult to access government support for exporting. Uh, and yet we hear from uh, government agencies that you know the support is there, people just need to, to ask for it. Similarly, there's a submission there from ADS, who are the, the trade uh, body mainly for the defence industry, uh, and uh, uh, they talk about how they feel there have been missed opportunities with uh, Scottish Enterprise and SDI and the trade groups not working together as effectively as they should. And I wonder, could you just give us what your take is, is on that? Is, do we have too cluttered a landscape? Are people not working as well together as they should be? Well, I think there's probably a lot of good work ongoing, both in government and in other organisations but it's just not joined up enough. And I think um, the prize to be won is so great. You know, if we could collaborate more effectively, um, the challenges are great in terms of improving our export performance in diversifying the range of industries and the, the numbers of companies that are involved in international trade. And I don't think government alone can do that. They certainly have a very key role to play and are playing. But I think the talk of collaboration which has gone back a number of years, hasn't really been affected into something that's tangible in reality and is genuine collaboration. Whether uh, that's because people are constrained by time, are very busy in terms of what they're doing, what they're charged with delivering, and haven't found the time and space to really sit down with all the key players. But I do feel, and I've read a number of the submissions, and there's expertise in all of these organisations that are submitting their views, that if we could find ways of joining that up effectively, it would help businesses, which is the most important point. And get, getting back to your observation that many companies just don't know where to go, I think is true. Companies will talk to the networks that they are part of already or have knowledge of. But if they get signposted too often um, to different agencies, they begin to lose heart, I'm sure. Uh, and it's at this early stage um, of intervention and supporting and signposting businesses to the correct sources of expertise at each stage that uh, we could be much more effective in, ho in helping companies across Scotland. So, sorry, Karen. And I, I think that also includes um, some the professional services, mm -hmm. the services like legal firms, accountancy firms, logistics companies, banks credit insurance agencies, I, th I get the sense that they're all very willing to be part of this debate and part of the solution, but there seems to be some need to integrate it more effectively. 
So, so what needs to be done to sort this out? I mean, where does the leadership need to, to come from? Well, first of all, I think we need to listen to what industry is saying. Um, I think we, Scotland, benefits from a lot of successful and established businesses who've done it all themselves, who are beyond the need for government help now, but are willing to contribute something back into the debate. So we should listen to them and listen to the small businesses who are in the early stages of finding their way through international trade aspirations and try to find out what are the issues that they're really concerned about. Um, it does come down to leadership and I think um, our organisation, others like us, need to engage with government and vice versa to say that we need to raise the debate further. We need to talk about how we can create greater capacity to support Scottish businesses in this arena and have that dialogue and have some concrete solutions coming out of that. I'll bring in Dennis Roberts. Yeah. Uh, maybe just following on from that, Ian, is um, I, I think it was basically the, the landscape, uh, and it was suggested there was you know this pl plethora of agencies, you know, to, to use the terminology that was there uh, within the evidence. Um, it suggested that maybe a, a single portal should be a, um, a, I suppose, a single portal sort of sort of. Sort of, sort of be there in, 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 an, in an effort to uh, afford the uh, signposting in a much more directive way. If that is to happen, who would actually set up this sort of central portal, this hub, and who would manage it? Mm. Who would pay for it? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's necessarily an easy solution to deliver. A single portal sounds good, um, sounds promising, but I think could be quite complex in arriving at agreement amongst all players as to where the areas of expertise lie, where the signposting should be. But I think it's worth spending the time to discuss that. Um, I think in terms of managing that process, there would have to be clarity about what the responsibility for that was before anyone would really sort of volunteer to take that on board. Government resources are larger than the resources of other organisations, so there is an absolutely key role there for the government agencies to play a leading part in coordinating <coughs> this kind of arrangement. Um, but I think I wouldn't want to be definitive at this stage before there's been a discussion about the content of a portal mm. as to who would... Yeah, there must have been some discussion already, though, in terms of... You know, this has been a, a suggestion that's been brought forward, mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, with the the comments within the Wilson review, that a lot of, uh, especially companies, don't know where to turn in the first place. So, therefore, you know, one solution would be to have this, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? I know it's a key um, proposal in the Wilson review, but to my knowledge, there hasn't been that detailed discussion about it. Subsequently, I think that still needs to happen, <coughs> but I think it's still very worthwhile because it's an idea that many players um, have interest in and think could make um, significant progress, yeah. particularly in helping businesses. Do you think it would actually afford, it would afford the uh, SME sector um, a sort of more level playing field in terms of accessing information um, and direction if this were to happen? Uh, because obviously I think you know, to some extent maybe they, they, they don't have the same access to the information or don't know where to go at the moment. That seems to be the, the, what, what the evidence is suggesting. So if we went down that particular route, do you think this would afford the SMEs that sort of level playing field in terms of accessing information? I think it would certainly open up information, the availability of information for SMEs. The problem for them is that they have very limited time to search themselves for information and they will probably still rely on some relationships that they have to guide them through that process. Um, but I think it's right that the information should be open and as available and accessible as possible to all kinds of companies across all sectors and all sizes throughout all of Scotland, um, and that there is some kind of level playing field there. I think smaller companies will still need some kind of advisor to help take them through that process. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are arrangements, obviously, with Business Gateway, yeah. for example, um, and other sort of local organisations. And I think we could have a sort of multi-tiered approach, um, which gives companies the opportunity to navigate themselves. But I think um, we shouldn't be reliant 
on companies having to do all of that digging themselves. There should still be expertise available to help them with that process. Okay. So in your view, in your view, who should pay for it? Who should pay for it? Yeah. Um, the single portal and manage it. I mean, I know you've said the discussions have to take place, but who do you think should pay for it? I think government should largely pay for it, but I think it could be a government industry partnership as well. And something I'd like to see more of is genuine industry-led activity. Um, so do you envisage taking a submission to government with that type of recommendation after discussion, of course? I, I would say the Wilson Review um, kind of suggested that SCDI would take on the management of the... Mm -hmm. The portal. We haven't had extensive discussions about that, but I think we'd be very willing to find out what would be involved and whether we could, whether we had the skills and the capability to deliver that effectively. But I think um, if other organisations felt if they wanted to play their part in it as well, which I think would be very important, mm -hmm. that we would have to have joint discussions and then come together with a proposal, which we, yes, would probably go to government for at least some kickstart funding. <coughs> okay, that's fine. That's okay. fine. All right, thank fine. you. Um, Chick Brody, you want to come in on it's this? Very quickly, this is almost like a rerun of a previous session we had with Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. It's all, all very well talking about money and funding. Who owns the leadership of the export drive in Europe? Well, I think um, we probably need to rebalance it somewhat and the industry needs to take more of a lead in saying this is what we need to help us maximise our potential in international markets. But there's no way of getting around that government is a key, key player in terms of the intervention and in helping make things happen. And I should have said good morning. I, I hear what you're saying, but at the end of the day is, you know, and I'll use the phrase again, where does the buck stop? It, it, you know, I have a view in terms of how we achieve the export drive and how we engage, and, and we'll come back to that later, I hope. Um, but somebody has to feel they own, you know, the, the, we have some exposures in, in terms of 50 large companies, you know, uh, are, are our main exporters. Mm -hmm. We need to drive a lot more of the uh, people up the, up the chain. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that if we look at the situation at the moment, um, the strategy is in the hands of government and the delivery of that strategy is in the hands of government managed and resourced, resourced by government. I do agree that industry has to play its part. Industry has to rise to the challenge at times. Companies of all sizes have to do their part in, in making progress. But I think there has to be collaboration between government and industry. Um, and ideally, it should be joint ownership. A strategy should be someone that all, something that all players sign up to, adopt, feel is realistic, right. is tangible. And right. that's not the case at the moment. Right. right. Thank you. I mean, the point is, we have partnerships and we have collaboration, but you know, at the end of the day, who says right? That's a strategy, and that's what's going to happen, and make decisions that, that drive the thing forward. We just don't have that, do we? We don't, because in terms of resources, um, the resources are largely in the hands of government. Um, industry should be able to help fund some of the activity as well but they need to see what the big plan is and to understand their role in it and how everybody will work to mutual benefit. I think that's the situation at the moment. It's, it's working very well in certain areas, but not to everyone's benefit. OK, thank you. Okay. Brief supplementary, uh, Richard Long. Uh, Brief um, morning. Um, I know that you actually drove uh, most of the visits, uh, trade missions, 370 market visits, mm -hmm. involving 6,000 companies, but you didn't tender in 2012. Uh, because of some issues around the contract. Why was that? Mm -hmm. Well, we've never wanted to air the issues publicly before, but the tender was in the public domain, so it's quite easy to say that there were some issues that we had reservations about at that time, which had, had appeared for the first time, and those were all <coughs> around restrictions on um, our potential to add value, as we saw it, to the activities. So, for example... Um, in terms of communication with companies, we could only communicate through a dedicated SE um, email address. Um, we had to signpost all companies to SDI for um, business advice in the lead-up to a visit, whereas we felt we had knowledge, insights and experience to add to the table. Um, 
publicity was all to be in the hands of SDI in terms of generating profile and press releases, inviting ministers, which was something that we had done fairly frequently. In fact, in the previous year, we had trade missions led by one led by the First Minister, another led by the Secretary of State for Scotland, and we felt that was all to the good in terms of galvanising support for Scottish businesses overseas, but whoever won the tender for that was going to be restricted in all of those areas. And it wasn't an easy decision for SCDI to make, bearing in mind our history, that we'd operated these projects for over 50 years and were best known for that, and our members wanted to, and continue to want to see that happen. But we had to decide, is this in our best interest as an organisation in terms of the added value that we want to bring to the party? Uh, sorry, I can't resist this question. Um, so do you feel you you know that it's went down since you your company or your uh, organization has went out the uh, out the, the, the situation I don't know what's happened to be honest um in terms of other activity I don't know whether what we did before has actually been replaced displaced in terms of other projects led by government but it's actually quite difficult to find out on any portal what's happening. If I was a business sitting somewhere in Scotland who wanted to see a forward trade mission programme over the next 18 months from Scotland, I would find it very difficult to access that information. So yes, I think it's a pity for the businesses that we have dealt with across Scotland in those kind of projects. Um, it was decided to leave it there at that time. We've worked with other organisations since, but in, a, in an ad hoc way, which is not sustainable. So Although we were putting our own resources and management time into these projects, in addition, we couldn't we couldn't justify we couldn't um, fund continuing that kind of activity ourselves. So, from our viewpoint, definitely a loss, and definitely a, a feeling of being squeezed out of that activity. Okay, um, I think Richard rather stole the ball from yeah. Lewis Macdonald, who was planning to ask about this. So we'll pass the ball back to Lewis. <laughs> Well, well, in fact, I, I think he, he set me up for a, a good, a good whip at the wall. I think because I mean, I, I think this gets right to the nub of the issues. Because if you've been delivering for fifty years uh, effective leadership of trade missions on behalf of Scottish business and industry, and the government then unilaterally changes the terms of reference in a way that stops you doing it, I think that sounds to me quite serious. Can, do you have a do you have an explanation? Do you know, or you've, have you had from government an explanation? for why they did that, why they changed those terms of reference in a way that made it difficult for you to pr proceed? Um, not really. We did, at the time, set out our reservations, the reasons underlying our decision not to bid for the contract. We set those out um, to Scottish Enterprise at the time. But I don't think we... Although I wasn't particularly closely involved at that time, I don't think we did really get any reasons behind the change of emphasis in the terms of the contract. And it's kind of evident that no one else, no other organisation found it appealing enough to take up that contract either. So um, we hadn't, there had been no question over the value that SCDI had brought to these projects beforehand. Um, the funding is quite, is relatively modest as well in terms of £50,000 a year to mount a series of four or five projects, including the funding available for companies participating. And the return on investment was the, the business achieved in terms of what companies were telling us directly about business that they had achieved, which was in the millions of pounds, I think, over the lifetime of the contract. It was over £20 million pounds businesses had said they had achieved as a result. So the contract was not let? Not to my knowledge, and, and 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 therefore that job, that that job, that valuable job that you'd done over that period of time, simply ceased to be done from out with from out with. As far as I can sector. see, yes, I can't see the that the same um, volume of activity has un been undertaken in those three years. There obviously are still um, trade missions undertaken by like Aberdeen Chamber of Commerce, for example, and their oil and gas expertise. Um, as far as I can see, SDI are the key player in the trade mission delivery mm. and I'm not aware that that activity has been replaced. So in a sense, we stepped backwards. In terms of the government-industry partnership, it was a step away from 
the so kind of model of partnership that the likes of the Wilson Review is recommending we ought to I think it certainly forward. felt like that from our point of view, yes. In, in, the, in the following paragraph of your submission, you also say, um, and I think it relates directly, that it's not possible to develop a forward programme offering market visit opportunities to aspiring exporters in the absence of core central funding. And now, is that, a, is that a, another reference to the 50,000, or is that a reference to something else that's, that's either disappeared or not been carried forward uh, in, in, in the recent past? No, I think that's probably the same issue um, yeah, yeah. in terms of the sort of guaranteed funding resources to enable planning to take place over a two to three year horizon, yeah. which is ideal for companies. Because uh, we did find that many companies started to look at markets um, that they wanted to visit and could see projects falling within the next 12 months or 24 months time frame, and they would they would build their activity around that. To be honest, and so <clears throat> does that mean is it implicit in that? And and, and I notice you also reference um, specific projects you've undertaken with local authorities, but is it implicit in that that you believe one of the things that we need to promote Scottish exports is some kind of core central funding from Scottish Absolutely. government. Absolutely. And, and that's, a, that's a, a gap in the market. Yes. Just, okay. um, just before I move on from this, I just want to pick up one point about, about the, the history of SCDI, because you mentioned trade missions were run, led by Scottish government ministers and, and UK government ministers from the, the Scotland office. Has that continued since, since SCDI ceased their involvement in trade missions? Um, I think um, Scottish ministers have led SDI organised trade missions. I'm not aware of the Scotland office being involved um, in recent years. I may be wrong, but to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any. Mm -hmm. um, and our point of view was that we were, we were actually trying to get the best of all worlds mm -hmm. by inviting ministers who were supporting the Scottish effort, and particularly as we're also relying on UKTI resources, um, the network globally that that was a very constructive way of generating profile and using these key figures to open doors on behalf of the delegations. And there's no doubt that that works. You know, Ministerial-led missions um, do open doors. Hmm. So, so uh, do you think SDI have frozen out UK government ministers, or is that just a conspiracy theory? <laughs> uh, I don't know the answer to that. I would imagine they would naturally, they work with Scottish government ministers closely, but they also work with UKTI. So hmm. I would think it was still in the interest of Scotland to have the opportunity to invite ministers from both governments whenever appropriate. Okay. I think Gordon MacDonald wants to make, make yeah, a point. Yeah, I was just wanting to ask a question. You, you said something about um, companies weren't aware of what trade missions, etc., and where to get support. If I picked you up correct, I've just, excuse me, um, convener, but I've just Googled SDI um, Scottish so, uh, exporters and I've also Googled support Scottish enterprise, uh, support Scottish e exporting. Both of them take me to the same page, which says join a trade mission overview. Are you eligible? What's involved? It's got a phone number. It's got an email address. When we were away um, on the trade mission last week, um, it was clear that SDI and UKTI were working closely together and the, the uh, guest of honour at the, the chamber uh, opening of, of the trade mission was actually Lord King. So I'm not sure where you're getting your information from, but from our experience, I wouldn't say that was correct. I'm happy to be corrected because I did yesterday try to find a forward programme of trade missions um, and couldn't. But um, I'm not here to denigrate the good work that SDI are doing because mm. if you talk to companies that are supported by SDI, they are very positive Absolutely. in most cases about the support that they're getting. So, But what I, I guess what I'm saying is that even they have limited resources and can't do everything to satisfy all companies across Scotland. Um, so that, that's where we come in, in, in wanting to complement the work that's already ongoing. But I, I take your point, that, and I, I do know that they work closely with UKTI, and we, we welcome that because we, we do want all the resources that are available from government in Scotland and in the UK to be available to Scottish companies. This is an important point, though, isn't it? That I mean, UKTI has 
10 times the staff, six times the number of offices around the world, access to export markets that SDI doesn't directly, um, uh, isn't directly represented in. Therefore, the ability, and Gordon is right to mention uh, Tom King, but he was there with UKTI um, on their part of that mission. Um, if Scottish exporters want support from UK government ministers, do you perceive that because it's only SDI that are working and there's not an industry input that it's perhaps more difficult to obtain that? I, I think we have to make sure that we show that, demonstrate we want that support. Um, mm -hmm. SCDI hosted a meeting with uh, Lord Livingston, UKTI Trade and Investment Minister, last week. Um, and there are definitely issues which UKTI can help with. If you look at the Scotch whisky industry, for example, they, they talk in their submission about trade policy being the main focus of the help that they need. And that tends to be at UK government and even at EU level, in fact. So it's a question of making sure that we can press on all the levers that are available to us to help us, whether it's with tra trade promotion activity or policy issues um, around um, free trade agreements or tariff barriers and so on, those kind of issues that UK government ministers can also help with. OK, I think we need to, to, to move on. I'll bring in uh, Joan McLaughlin. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, you acknowledge in your submission the success of the client account based approach of Scottish Enterprise, but you also talk about the companies who are missing out on potential support because perhaps they're not uh, as part of that client account uh, based approach, particularly SMEs. Um, I represent the south of Scotland and, and during our budget scrutiny um, it emerged that the number of uh, growth export companies in Dumfries and Galloway, for example, was 1.8% of uh, the total in Scotland and I wondered whether you thought that the enterprise network uh, because of that um, perhaps isn't supporting export growth companies in, out with the central belt as much as it could? Um, I think again from the various submissions that I've read it's uh, an issue that many organisations have raised. Those, who f those companies who feel excluded, um, who are not account managed, don't necessarily feel that they have the support that they need. I wouldn't have any evidence to say that the Enterprise Network has created the situation you're describing in Dumfries and Galloway, but I'm sure so access to um, enter the Enterprise Network officials um, may vary across the country. Uh, and we need to, that, that's why we're very keen to take a Scotland-wide approach and see where, where there are gaps, who else can help fill those gaps. I guess we can't have all companies account managed, but we need to think there is export potential in other companies mm -hmm. who are excluded from that network, and we need to think, are there other ways that we collectively can help them mm -hmm. make progress in, in terms of what their own objectives are? Within the Highlands and Islands um, enterprise network, obviously the threshold is lower in terms of company turnover, mm -hmm. for getting the support that they get from mm -hmm. HIE, um, whereas in rural parts of the Scottish enterprise network, like the south of Scotland, the threshold is just the same as it would be for the central bell. Um, and from the point of view of SMEs getting support to export, have you noticed a difference, say, for example, in rural parts of the Scottish enterprise network and the HIE uh, geographical area? I think there will often be differences in other rural parts of Scotland from the Highlands and Islands just because the Highlands and Islands has its own dedicated enterprise network with its own arrangements. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably if we, if we can find the evidence that um, companies in other rural areas are excluded from the kind of support services that they need, that we should be able to make a case for addressing some of these issues mm -hmm. and, and reviewing some of the thresholds that are sure. applied. Right. And the, the other thing you see in your own submission is that building greater confidence to export can come from creating lo local networking opportunities for business where they can share their experience of network uh, of exporting both both good and bad. Are there areas of the country where you think that those networks, you know, like could do with, you know, being strengthened? There's probably quite a lot of areas, but I guess rural areas would come to the fore again because networks tend to be city and city region uh, dominated. But I think what we're probably looking for is some kind of consistency of approach across the whole of Scotland in terms of local networks. 
that um, budding exporters can come along to and learn from those who've already uh, met some of the challenges successfully. And I think that's something that we are very clear about in our minds is that um, getting businesses together to share experience is of tremendous value, probably underestimated value. There's a lot that they can do to help each other. Um, in our trade missions, for example, which were always multi-sectoral, um, we found that it was a fantastic vehicle, not just to achieve business, to build up the confidence of some of the first-time exporters because they were spending time in the company of their peers, others who'd done it before them, not necessarily competitors, sometimes from different sectors, but building up that um, confidence and also a, almost a sense of shared camaraderie where even on return to Scotland, these companies would keep in touch with each other and refer each other to sources of additional assistance and expertise and contacts. So in terms of local delivery of export clubs or export networks, whatever you'd like to call it, I think we need to look at a plan that is Scotland-wide mm -hmm. and gives companies in the rural areas as much support, as much access as in other in the cities and other regions. Do you as an organisation do much work in rural areas? We are part of our strategy at the moment, our three-year strategy is to develop our regional footprint further and we are looking at Ayrshire and Dumfries and Galloway right now. So we have been down to Dumfries and Galloway meeting colleges, major companies and so on. Um, so we're, we're trying to do as much as we can within our limited resources, but it's part of our philosophy at the moment, yeah. Okay. And just uh, finally, Convener, um, certainly when we took evidence from uh, businesses in, in, in Perthshire, what struck, struck me particularly was the number that said that a lot of their marketing was done through the, the internet. They didn't actually use advertising. The, the website, if you had an effective website, it was it was a great way to make, make contact with overseas clients. Um, uh, is that your experience as well? And you know, what more should we be doing in order to um, get more companies uh, yeah. to understand that the importance mm. of that? In terms Absolutely, of I think the digital issues are, are very important now. First of all, we need to ensure that as much of Scotland, all of Scotland, has access to high-speed broadband. That's mm -hmm. the the basic um, tenet, um, but also. De devoting some resources to helping companies understand the potential of the internet and how to approach it properly. So as an example, SCDI has been working with UKTI on web optimization masterclasses where an expert will come in with some companies, a small group of companies, and go through all the process of how they can adapt their website, how they can maximise the potential to make it effective as a global marketing tool and to deal with global business. So, yes, I think it is um, an issue that we need to take more account of. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Brody, supplementary. Yeah, very quickly, um, you mentioned your strategy that you're working on, and, and Joe McAlpin mentioned uh, the plan focusing on rural. Is there actually, in your book, a Scottish Government export plan? Are you aware of the export strategy of the government? either directly or through SDI? Um, I would say yes, um, aware. There, there's a, a parallel inquiry going on at the moment with the European Committee on Connecting Scotland, which was asking questions about <coughs> government strategies for um, international connectivity and for specific market plans. I know of some of these plans because... There has been dialogue about them. Organisations like SCDI get involved when they're created or refreshed in discussions. But our point is that nobody else in the outside world knows about them, particularly the businesses who are the ones who have to deliver the detail of that plan. So, so where is the plan? Um, well, Scottish Enterprise hold that plan in terms of their, their own strategy and plans specifically for export targets for Scotland. Thank you. Uh, okay, Gordon McDonald. Thanks, Convener. Um, I'm keen to understand um, wh whether we have the right level of support in place to encourage companies to, to export. Um, the submission from the Institute of Chartered Accountants England and Wales 
uh, it says it is also clear many Scottish businesses lack the ambition, resources and in some cases courage to take the substantial risks involved in seeking to open up worldwide markets. Now, given that you had some responsibility up to 2012 for encouraging companies to go on trade missions, um, why, you know, over that 50-year period, have we still only got um, 50 large companies that are doing the majority of exporting, you know, given that you had those 50 years to try and address that problem? Um, I think that there is an issue about lack of ambition at times in businesses across Scotland, not just relating to exports. Um, I'm not sure about the lack of courage. I think there are ways of mitigating some of the concerns that many fledgling exporters will have um, because if you put yourself in the perspective of a person running a small business who's responsible for all aspects of that business, it looks like a, some degree of risk. It looks like a lot of time and resource without any um, guaranteed payback. So we can understand that there may be reservations. But that's where getting sort of professional advice and expertise into companies, talking to banks, credit insurance, talk, talking to legal firms, talking to logistics companies to help them understand how they could deal with some of these issues mm. would would spur them on, hopefully, mm. and give them a framework of support to build confidence in that respect. Um, I don't think SCDI should take the whole blame for 50 years of lack of ambition. Well, I'm not suggesting you should. <laughs> but I think our economy has been through massive change in the last mm. few decades. Mm -hmm. One of the questions in the inquiry was about the drop in manufactured exports. And we pointed out the the change in the electronic yeah. sector was, which was absolutely dominant in yeah. the value of Scotland's exports at that time. Absolutely. And we appreciated all of that activity. Yeah. And Scotland was well known, Silicon Glen, yeah. all of that. But um, the end result was that that investment was fairly rapidly mobile when global circumstances changed. So Scotland has had to deal with a lot in terms of adapting to different circumstances. But we still have a lot of companies with huge potential. We have a lot of traditional manufacturing and engineering companies that have adapted to global change, that have huge knowledge and expertise that they're now able to sell commercially to overseas markets. Mm -hmm. So as much as making things, it's the know-how in terms of project management. Um, so I wouldn't lose all hope. I think our, our point is that there's huge potential yeah. and a lot of untapped potential in Scottish business that we need to somehow release and build that confidence to make them think about being players in international markets, de-risk some of that, take some of the mythology out yeah. of it as well. And I know that's, that is something that SDI are doing a lot about as well. They talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good because we need to with companies in local networks at the very start, say there are risks involved in exporting, but here are some of the people that can help you with that. And this is how you can start planning your adventure and taking it forward. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you've greatly identified that there's a, a huge potential and we do have to de-risk it and build confidence. Is the SDI Smarter Exporter Programme, is, is it up to scratch for actually supporting companies? Um, I'm not sure I would really be able to comment on Smart Exporter Programme because I know I know what it's about and what it's aimed to deliver, but I've not I've not seen any evidence of the impact. Um, I think that would be useful. That's an example mm -hmm. of an initiative where it would be useful to have some public discussion about the value of that, so mm -hmm. that we can learn the, any lessons, the good and anything that's been ineffective to take forward into new initiatives. But one of the challenges, I think, is that we don't have enough public debate about exporting, about why we're not good enough at exporting, why our performance is lower than it should be. Mm -hmm. I think the Global Connections Survey is something that should be debated much more widely in Scotland, across academia, across the media, within government. To me, there's a lot of information there that is buried and not really mm -hmm. actively engaged in terms of thinking what is the way forward for all of us. But as far as smart exporters is concerned, I'm 
I'm not actually sure what the results have been, so I wouldn't really want to comment on that. OK. And my final question is, um, how effective do you think is the Global Scott Network? Uh, has it been of benefit to companies? Uh, you uh, mentioned earlier on that um, you know trade missions in the past, mm -hmm. it was important that companies learn from their peers. So is this a, another effective... Um, I think the, the value of Global Scots themselves as individuals is fantastic. <coughs> Is probably quite unparalleled and it was something that we were always keen to do in market is if we could to engage global scots just to come along and interact with the companies because they had a huge amount of practical information and knowledge that, about that market yeah. that they can share with others so hugely beneficial but we've had we have heard from some global scots themselves that they feel underutilized and some companies in scotland that don't know if they are able to access them or not. So I think we could benefit from clarifying the access arrangements, again, giving more publicity to the network and what it can help achieve, and just to make it easier for them to play a real part. Because I know the Global Scots themselves have a real willingness to do something that actually aids Scotland's international effort. And we really want to capitalise on that as much as possible. Thanks so okay. much. Thank you. Okay. Um, Joanne Levin. Um, thank you very much. I'm interested, you, we've talked already about, you said you need to have a Scottish approach, but you need local networking and recognising the diversity um, within Scotland. Highland and Ireland's managed to do that, but it seems that Scottish Enterprise doesn't. So is there something that Scottish Enterprise should be doing differently? You, I mean, given the, the, the scale of the area they're responsible for, it would be rather foolish to have one size fits all. But I'm also interested in how you think or who should drive these local networks and should it be at a city level? We know that there are city wide, say Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen have their own initiatives. Should how can they be supported to get companies at that local level together? And indeed smaller companies now, for example, in the Highlands and Islands, people are developing businesses precisely because of the internet. So there's an opportunity to, you know, to stabilise populations in some very fragile island communities because of that opportunity. How do you get those to work together? Because it feels as if it's almost all too small for Scottish enterprise, but you're saying at the same time it does need to be done at a Scottish level. I think this is where it really does need to feed into a collaboration agenda. If we want some kind of consistency of approach across Scotland while still allowing flexibility... I think it's the discussion between the Scottish Enterprise and others, whether the cities, whether SCDI, the Chambers of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, about how we, how we resource that activity, first of all, and then how we can arrange it to the best effect so that we can recognise local situations, local circumstances, but still give those companies access to the best advice and the best experience and bring in experienced players to meet them to discuss the challenges they faced what succeeded what didn't because I, I firmly believe in my experience that businesses want more than anything else to hear from other businesses that have gone before them perhaps in the same sector but not necessarily there are still read across issues across sectors um, so I think it's part of the dialogue with Scottish Enterprise and others to say Perhaps it's not something that Scottish Enterprise have the capacity or to, to deliver themselves or think is uppermost in their priorities, but how can we make sure that we're working together and others can get involved in delivering that across Scotland? I mean, is it something to do with the role that Scottish Enterprise has for itself? And we talked about perhaps perceived lack of ambition, and um, which is perhaps rather unfair if people don't have the confidence, but is part of it that Scottish Enterprise looks to see what's successful and supports it rather than taking risk with supporting mm. companies to, to take risk, which is quite a different <coughs> kind of, of view. And, and does that therefore mean that there's whole loads of potential energy out there that the, the government agencies don't see as part of their responsibility? Mm. I think, to be fair to Scottish Enterprise, they do talk a lot about leadership and ambition <laughs> as being absolutely key to maximising our exporting success. And they are working with very aspiring and ambitious companies. Um, and I think it's probably a capacity issue that they, 
they, they're working with the ones that they think will work most effectively, and they can't do all of it, and they can't do more of it. But what I, I'm probably coming from the point of view that there are other organisations that can help complement their activity by becoming key players in those other areas. Because probably we, we all have, we can all agree in certain premises and the, the issues of dealing with the confidence and injecting ambition are something that we would probably all agree with all organisations. So some of us can play an active role there where Scottish Enterprise don't have the capacity or don't um, think that's the priority in their agenda, dealing with smaller companies outside the account managed companies in their, their cohort of clients. Is, is there another role for your organisations like you to give the opportunity for businesses to be heard, but not just to support each other when they're thinking about exporting, but almost a stage before that, at a very early stage, how many of our young people think they want to go into business at all? And if they were going to go into business, would they think about doing that kind of quite scary stuff? What are the kinds of things... I mean, do you think there's a role for yourself or other organisations, or is it government or who, that's perhaps going colleges, universities, schools, or wherever, to try and support where there is the enterprise agenda being developed? I think these are absolutely huge issues. Uh, there are huge challenges there and, and opportunities. And I think dealing with young people in terms of generating more of a global mindset, um, helping them understand their position in Scotland in a global world, mm -hmm. Some of them might want to immediately get more involved in international business, for example. So it's giving them the tools that they can start learning from an early stage, working with SMEs, for example, working with international students who are in Scotland, which is a really untapped resource in terms of the additional benefits they could give SMEs. Um, if you have Chinese or Brazilian students in Scotland, and, a small, and an SME is looking to, to approach China or Brazil, it would be ideal to marry them up mm. on a project basis with that international student, giving them a bit of professional experience, but they'd be bringing all of their cultural assets to the table in terms of their knowledge of that country, accelerating communication, opening doors for the company. I think there are so many challenges and we would love to get involved in as many as possible, but I think that dealing with young people and building confidence is a, a key one. Is that mapped anywhere? I'm, I'm conscious that my own local FE college does a lot of international business. How do you, is there a means by which, for A, we know where that's happening, and B, then letting businesses know that these folk are there and that there's some opportunity to come together? I think as far as the colleges are concerned, I would, I would imagine Colleges Scotland probably do map that because there are quite a number of colleges across Scotland that are very active internationally, um, that are running contracts overseas in terms of training personnel in oil and gas or whatever subjects. So some of them have real expertise to offer. Um, I think this is a dilemma. There is a huge amount of good work going on in the Scottish economy, but it's, it's not joined up enough for people to know that it exists first of all, and then to be able to share that good practice more widely. And I think that's something that we would all want to strive towards, really highlighting best practice rather than reinventing the wheel and enabling that kind of cross-fertilisation of learning and ideas mm -hmm. more easily. Can I just ask one very last yeah. point about joined up? It does strike me, we talk about government responsibility here, but obviously there's both the Scottish Government and the Scottish Scotland Office. What... <laughs> sense do you have of in relation to this particular issue about supporting people to export and supporting business what connections are there between Scottish Government and Scotland Office? Between them? Uh -huh. um, do you have a sense that they, they are working in a joint strategy? I would probably say prior to the referendum there wasn't a lot of evidence of that connectivity I couldn't honestly say if that's changed since um, but I think probably at the highest level there's a recognition that there's a lot to gain from the Scottish Government and UK government agencies collaborating effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but the I would point say I'm making about the Scotland Office is, is a Scottish organisation, mm -hmm. 
but it's obviously part of the UK government, so it's clearly got both resource and an understanding mm -hmm. of business, as does the Scot Scottish government. It would seem odd if they were in competition with each other rather than... I just mm -hmm. wondered if you knew there were structures which brought them together. Is there a formal way in which they, they work together? You may not know that. But uh, I'm not aware of a structure, no. I know that there was a large-scale export event um, a few months ago in Edinburgh, which... Um, SDI, Scottish Enterprise, and UKTI collaborated on very closely, involving 400 companies coming to learn about exporting. That's the kind of thing that should happen. Mm -hmm. Scotland Office is very active in inter international business, in promoting services and so on. But I'm not aware of a formal structure. Um, that's not to, to say it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. and that dialogue goes on that I'm just not aware of. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Patrick Harvey. Thanks, convener. Good morning. Um, a few minutes ago, you were talking about the way the Scottish economy has changed uh, and the global context has changed uh, over recent decades. I was wanted to, to cast that forward a bit and look at the change uh, that we need to be ready for, the change to come that we need to be engaging with. Um, quite a lot of your documents, SCDI's documents, are, are peppered with uh, perhaps one of the, the most loosely used buzzwords in the world, sustainability. Uh, and indeed the Scottish Government's favourite oxymoron, sustainable economic growth. Um, I, was, I was drawn to um, a, a paragraph in a document, Future Scotland, published in May 2013, which talks about uh, the next couple of decades uh, and the prospect of a perfect storm as emerging economies grow and the burden on the planet's resources peaks, pressure on the global commons it, which itself is an interesting choice of language. Pressure on the global commons from emissions to water scarcity will increase, as will the potential for financial crises and cybercrime. And elsewhere in the document, it talks about the challenges and as well as opportunities from uh, areas such as the big data agenda, the Internet of Things, and, and so on, the, the challenges that come from a, a hyper-connected world. What definition of sustainability does your organisation use, and how is it applied? What areas of economic activity would you see as having potential for increased quantity, but having the wrong quality for the future? Well, obviously, in terms of sustainability, we're obviously looking to the agenda that has been set, that has been agreed by government here in Scotland on carbon reduction, on, on deploying resources effectively, um, on the circular economy, for example, or looking at innovative ways of minimising impact on the planet while still producing the products that we want to consume in a sustainable way. I I'm not sure that I can come to you with an SCDI definition of sustainability. You might think it's, it's loose. Um, it's often loosely used. We, we're, off, we're also accommodating within our membership such a diversity of interests um, that there probably isn't of course. agreement or common ground amongst those members as to what that would mean. But I think there's a general acknowledgement that carbon reduction and looking at how we use resources and how we continue to re-engage resources is, is high on the agenda. But are there any examples, bearing in mind the, the tone of that paragraph I read out from, from your, mm. your document there, are there any examples that you could cite where you've taken a view that a particular uh, form of economic activity is increasing pressure on those global commons unacceptably and therefore is not something you seek to support, uh, or one where you identify opportunities to contribute to the global commons uh, and therefore mm -hmm. an area where you would have uh, a greater interest, not just in seeing more of stuff, but the right kind of economic activity. And are you relating this to our sort of exporting activity? Yeah. Or the, yeah. I think um, Scotland has some expertise in issues around waste management, wastewater management, those kind of that kind of know-how intelligence that we can commercially engage with other markets around the world to help them find solutions to some of their growing problems as fast-growing economies. Um, obviously the whole issue of pollution in rapidly industrialising countries is a key challenge not just for that country but globally 
And so uh, there are companies that are developing expertise, developing services and products that help minimise that kind of adverse reaction. And so those are kind of business opportunities that we are supporting and should be supporting. Um, and I think there is there's a green agenda woven into um, a lot of the, the Scotland's export strategy. Um, but it's a question of the companies that we can identify that are able to do something um, beyond their domestic market. And, and the separate question of how much destructive activity it sits alongside. Well, there, there probably is a fair amount of destructive activity still ongoing. It is, it's changing the balance in the economy here as well, isn't it, in terms of what kinds of businesses that we have and what they're doing. But um, I, I think there are there's greater visibility now of the global challenges in terms of climate security, food security, water in particular, and companies are responding to that in the market by saying there's an opportunity for me in terms of my scientific background, whatever, to develop a proposition that would help with that, uh, that challenge in overseas markets. So I think it's a question of that balance changing over time, perhaps not fast enough to satisfy you, but, um, but I think we are aware of it and the Scottish Government and its agencies are definitely aware of it. Time for one final question on a, a slightly different topic. Um, you mentioned also, uh, in response to another member's questions, the Global Scot Network, mm -hmm. uh, and you talked about the commitment that its members have to Scotland. Unless this has been changed rather quietly without anybody noticing it, I think Donald Trump is still a member of the mm -hmm. Global Scot Network, someone who has attacked and damaged the environment locally in Scotland, mm -hmm. who had attacks and continues to attack uh, both in the mess, uh, in the media and in the courts, Scotland's energy policy, Scotland's energy policy, uh, and also who has attacked and bullied individuals and communities in Scotland. Isn't that a bit of a joke if we keep someone like that as part of the Global Scot Network? Okay, Mr. I, I think I think you should not feel obliged to answer that question. You're free to answer it if you wish. But you may not wish. Thankfully, to I wasn't responsible for that appointment. But um, no. I, I hear what uh, the member says, and I don't think I should comment on that further. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, a couple more members want to come back in. Um, firstly, Lewis MacDonald. Yeah. A couple of things uh, very quickly. Um, first of all, on the balance of exporting, uh, oil and gas engineering, Scotch whisky, food, um, universities and colleges all do very well internationally. But in a way, their success highlights the failure of other sectors. Is there something further that either government or organisations like SCDI can do to encourage other sectors uh, to engage effectively in export? Uh, in other words, is there a sectoral issue here or is it just about individual companies? Um, it's a very good question. I don't know that there's, there are obvious sectors to talk about. I mean, if you look at the textiles sector, for example, which has traditionally been a very successful exporter and still is, mm -hmm. has had, um, the Scottish sector has had challenges because of global competition, global issues, but, but there is a kind of strategy behind that sector to help the companies there in their continuing export endeavours. So I think um, there are no obvious sectors that have huge potential that are not being addressed, I would imagine. But I think um, when there are priority sectors for government, there are other <coughs> sectors that perhaps don't get as much attention, and that's where others can come in and see if we can give them adequate support Know, to fulfil their potential. Um, but I think it's probably more a question of individual companies as well. That, that's very helpful. And, and, and finally, the, the, you mentioned the importance of digital connectivity, clearly vital to any export company, also vital to export companies, as some of us discovered last week, is direct air connections to potential markets. Um, so, for example, Edinburgh to Doha, mm -hmm. Glasgow to Dubai um, are vital to Scottish businesses doing work in the Middle East. Um, but there's no connection from Aberdeen to the Middle East, mm -hmm. which is a, a kind of glaring uh, omission in, in a sense. But you do say in your submission that an, an air route development fund, such as was abolished eight years ago, would, would be a good thing mm -hmm. um, for promoting Scottish exports. Could you say a little bit more about the potential for that? Well, it's something that I think was regarded as a great success in the past. We do appreciate that it... Um, 
came up against EU rules and we have to find ways of addressing that but I think there are other examples perhaps in the European Union where such support is still given um, but there's no doubt that the Route Development Fund was very instrumental in encouraging some airlines to come in to Scottish destinations because it's the first as I understand it, the first couple of years are absolutely critical in terms of the marketing operation and justifying to their own airlines that there is enough of a market to fly direct from Scotland. So that was absolutely critical in making the decision for some airlines to trial direct routes from Scotland. Yeah, and something that should be looked yeah. at again as a matter of importance. And SEDI would always... Um, take into account the needs of the North East and the Highlands and Islands as well in terms of air connectivity to London, for example. Um, it's absolutely crucial. So we need to keep firing on all fronts to, to raise that agenda. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Chip Brody. Yeah, two very quick questions. Following on from John Lamont's question about, and you were talking about young people, can you tell me firstly what representations SCDI have made to the Home Office regarding their asinine strategy on visas, uh, because as you know the Fresh Talent Initiative uh, has gone, uh, which would have encouraged young people, young uh, international people to stay in Scotland and do the very things you were talking about. That's the first one. And the second question is, so SCDI have expressed doubt that the Scottish Government's target on exports will be met. Can you tell me why? Um, I, I think doubt expressed in that paper wasn't based on any robust evidence. It was on the feeling that more about the state of some of the key markets that Scotland is exporting to, rather than saying that an ambitious target is going <coughs> to be reached. I think it was particularly around the Eurozone markets, which have been quite challenging um, for Scottish exporters recently. But having said that, the latest um, export figures did um, indicate a 7% increase, which was very encouraging. So uh, I guess there's still a lot to play for and we wouldn't want to sort of downplay the opportunity to reach that target. So our, our comment was really on some of the difficulties in other economies. Um, on the other issue, yes, we have made um, regular, continuous representations to the Home Office, to the Border Agency, because it's one of the key issues that we hear about regularly from our members, particularly in universities and colleges, um, issues around student visas and the opportunity for international students to continue working and contributing to the Scottish economy for a period longer. Um, and we do absolutely agree that the Fresh Talent Initiative was a fantastic opportunity and a great success as far as we could see. And it would be absolutely ideal if we could continue to tap into that international experience of students coming to Scotland uh, because they bring those cultural dimensions and understandings as well, can help populate some of our younger people, their, their Scottish cohorts, with um, a broader outlook, perhaps. Um, so, yes, the visa situation is something that we, are, we have concerns about, absolutely. Good, thank you. Yeah. Dennis Robertson. Hey, thanks very much, convener. Um, <clears throat> Scottish Enterprise and High, um, probably via through uh, SDI, have stated quite clearly with their new business plans that they're, they're looking towards the internationalisation uh, programme for experts, uh, exports. Uh, and they're talking about the, the opportunities um, that they, they face. And it's, Scottish Enterprise have stated quite clearly that they'll be there at the very beginning uh, on that journey um, to realise people's ambition, um, to take them through a, the process, um, to offer the guidance, support that they actually need. Do you believe that's not happening? Because from what I can gather, you know, there's a suggestion that it's maybe not happening, but it's clear within their business plan and the, the papers that they've submitted that they are there at the forefront to take forward the internationalisation programme uh, uh, within the exports. No, I, I would welcome the comments that they've made there. I, I think they have to be at the forefront of that internationalisation drive. And I think over the years, the agenda has widened. We've touched on some of the subjects this morning, the, the sheer number of subjects that can be included in terms of fulfilling our potential internationally. So I would welcome and endorse what they say there, but I think there are opportunities for further collaboration with others to really maximise that agenda. Because it, Can you expand on that? 
Um, well, I think the issues that many organisations are hearing from their own networks, that there are companies which are still confused, don't know how to get the right kind of help, don't know where to access information, and if that is still the case, we need to address it. Well, that takes us very back to the very beginning of today's evidence in some respects of, 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 of setting up a network to, to try and ensure that the evidence is clear uh, for people mm. to access in the first. But, I mean, SE are saying that they, they're there and they're providing the evidence and raising the awareness. Do you believe they're not? No, I'm not saying... I don't believe they're not. You know, obviously, an initiative like the Smart Exporter was aimed, mm -hmm. as I understand, to get more volume of businesses into exporting to really attack more of the mass market, if you like, in terms of the inexperienced exporters, giving them the basic tools to understand what the journey ahead of them is. Um, probably what I'm saying, if anything, is that I don't know the outcome of that, so I can't comment one way or the other, but I think it would be good, it would be useful if those outcomes were shared more widely so that we all understood the and, lessons and that have been learned. And perhaps finally, uh, some of the challenges that face, uh, uh, obviously, uh, some of the businesses in exporting are things like APD and obviously access to um, the maybe ports um, uh, for freight and, and costs. Is this something that, uh, that is, is very much um, a, your opinion that, that, that your members are stating to you are some of the obstacles that uh, that are being presented to them mm -hmm. and actually prevents them from exporting? Mm -hmm. I think um, there are certainly obstacles there that we've heard to make exporting more difficult. Um, access to ports, uh, the congestion, the, the routes and the time taken to get to ports, um, particularly for uh, long-haul destinations. So we've put some of our views forward in a, another submission on freight mm -hmm. to the infrastructure sure. committee, I think. So yeah. um, you might see some details in there that you're looking for. Yeah. Um, but yes, it, it's an issue that um, even the successful experienced exporters do come up against from time to time is the actual logistical challenges of getting their goods to market. And your opinion on APD? Oh, um, SCDI has always advocated APD and we welcome the devolution of APD and eradicating it as an uncompetitive okay. tax. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just, just on that point of APD, how quickly would you like to see that removed or, <laughs> or, or reduced? Because the current, I mean, as I understand that the Scottish <laughs> Government <laughs> policy is to uh, reduce it by 50% uh, within the term of the next Parliament, which could be six years away is that is that satisfactory no i think we would want to see more rapid um effect than that it, it, if we look at the competitiveness of aviation taxes in the uk compared to other international markets it does seem quite a deterrent at the moment and particularly in scotland when we have geographical issues to deal with in terms of our people uh, flying around the world it's a, an, an added burden that we could do without okay, okay. um briefly richard Lyle. Just quickly, to round it up, um, thank you, convener. You were at the forefront of trade missions, all the exports for the last 50 years, you know, decades. If the opportunity came again with a, a decent contract or a, a contract that you liked, would you take part? Yes, we never said that we wouldn't want to continue being involved. At the moment, we are we're looking more at the issues um, that are affecting exporters. We're talking to our experienced exporters and trying to see how they can help SMEs. That's our agenda at the moment. But in terms of taking companies to the market, I think we've been very good at that over the years. I've built up knowledge and yes, we'd want to continue playing that role if the opportunity is there on the right terms. Thank you. Okay, thank you. If there are no more questions, we'll call a halt there. Um, slightly over time, but that's been a very useful session. Thank you very much, Mr McTaggart. Um, we will now have a very short suspension to uh, just allow a changeover.
Okay, if we can uh, reconvene, please. Um, item three on the agenda. Um, there was a committee uh, visit uh, last week to uh, Saudi Arabia, shadowing a trade mission which was run by SDI in conjunction with UKTI and um, Gordon uh, MacDonald, Lewis MacDonald and myself attended that, accompanied by uh, Dougie Wands and uh, Greg uh, Little. Um, just to report back to members briefly on um, what was discussed at that, um, this was for uh, what was called uh, British Energy Week in Al Kobar, uh, the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, which is up on the, the, the Persian Gulf uh, coast. Uh, as I said, it was uh, a joint UKTI and SDI sponsored uh, trade mission. There were about um, between 30 and 40 companies represented, of which I think 10 were uh, from Scotland, many of them from the, the northeast. So we attended sessions with the uh, Ash Asharkia, I hope I pronounced that, Chamber, which was a local chamber of commerce in the area um, that provided companies with an introduction to the opportunities and challenges to doing business in the region. We met with the head of the board of directors uh, of the chamber to discuss opportunities for Scottish businesses in the oil and gas sector, particularly in the eastern region, which is the energy hub of Saudi Arabia. We had met representatives and indeed had a lot of, a lot of engagement with uh, Scottish companies who are participating in the trade mission to understand their objectives from the visit. And the feedback, I would say, was, was generally very positive. They were uh, reporting productive meetings with Saudi counterparts and possible leads for future contracts. And I think what the committee would like to do is follow up in the next few weeks with the uh, companies who were there to see exactly what the productive benefit has been from participation in the mission. Uh, whilst there, we had a number of discussions with both UK TI and SDI officials in order to better understand the support they provide to companies seeking to internationalise in this market and elsewhere. We met with several uh, global Scots working in the region and found out more about the support they offer to Scottish companies seeking to enter the local uh, market. And along with SDI officials, met representatives from the Al Qatani group of companies who are a Saudi trading family to discuss opportunities for future partnerships uh, with Scottish companies in the oil and gas and in the education sectors. And my overall impression was um, that certainly from the, the Scottish companies participating, I think they, they um, had a, a favourable impression. Um, they uh, were um, praiseworthy of the service being offered by UKTI and SDI. Suddenly the SDI people on the ground were extremely knowledgeable, very well connected, very good at opening doors and setting up contacts. And um, it'll be interesting to follow up uh, in a few weeks' time and find out exactly what concrete business deals have been done as a result of that investment. Uh, but that was my impression. I'm happy if, if either Lewis or, or Gordon have anything they want to add to that. Lewis? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of things maybe that I would, I would want to add, and I guess particularly in terms of some of the companies um, uh, and also the, some of the way in which the Saudi British Energy Week was organised. So there were a number of, I thought, very effective seminars for companies about how to trade. I was um, very surprised. Uh, there's an Aberdeen uh, technology company called Caladine whose opening I spoke at some 12 years ago, and I was very surprised to discover that one of the Saudi Arabian businessman, the general manager of Safawi, who addressed one of our conference sessions, was the new owner of Caladine, having bought it uh, over Christmas. So the, the, I thought that was one of the interesting things was the way in which trade and investment is, is flowing in both directions. I was also struck, and there were other clearly other Aberdeen companies like Asco and Rayburn there that um, uh, those of us, um, Dennis, I'm sure, will know as well <coughs> in, in the North East. But, but I was also struck by a couple of the um, less obvious participants, uh, Sarah Galbraith, who's a Scottish businesswoman, although uh, based in Cheshire and there with UKTI, but she was there to uh, seek work in training women, Saudi Arabian women, in taking lead roles in business. That's a very uh, new departure in Saudi Arabia and I think very uh, welcome. Um, Angela Mathis was there again from, from Edinburgh with um, looking to um, promote uh, high-tech solutions across a range of industries. So I think I was struck by the fact that, although rightly the, there was a large focus on oil and gas and there are obviously opportunities there in oil and gas, 
um, I was struck by the, the broad range of interests and, and also the sign of some progressive change within the Saudi Arabian economy, which mm -hmm. is welcome. Okay, thank you. Gordon? Yeah, just a couple of things. I, I think, first of all, on behalf of the committee, uh, I think we should write to Hadi Fossil and thank him because I don't think we would have had the amount of access that we did get, especially with the Al Qatani family, if uh, had he hadn't made those arrangements. So I think on behalf of the committee, we should write and thank him for that level of support. Um, secondly, um, it was clear from the Saudis that they weren't interested in um, people that wanted to sell them standard products at, at discount price. Um, the, the term that came across very often was Saudiization, I think it was where um, they were fed up having had oil for 75 years that they weren't making more of the profit further down the line where um, the manufacturing was coming out. So what they are looking for is companies who are innovative and who are willing to put down roots in Saudi to employ uh, highly skilled Saudi individuals. And we saw the thing that frightens me and should frighten a lot of exporters at the moment uh, is um, the development that's taking place in Jamal. Um, we heard about the um, joint venture with uh, the Dow Chemical Company of America where there is a new um, chemical plant being built which will be one of the most efficient in the world. Um, it's coming on stream next year and it's costing, was it 30 billion or something like that? And it's in a situation where it will take the raw materials, um, produce the chemicals, and then move on to the next stage of producing paint, plastics, cosmetics, the works to export abroad. So not only will a lot of companies who currently provide that um, those items to the Saudi market will lose that market share, they will then have to compete with one of the most modern, efficient plants in the world that's being produced and coming on stream next year, which will eat into their market. So it's a huge danger for a lot of companies, I think. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. And again, any questions you want to make about this? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I should also just mention briefly, I think two members, Gordon and myself, on Monday visited uh, Grangemouth. Um, and we visited the, the, the fourth port's operation at Grangemouth and then met with WH Malcolm, the um, uh, transport company, which was a very interesting visit. And that was done jointly with the um, ITI committee. And uh, it was very useful. And um, I'm sure we'll be reporting back on that in due course. OK, well, that we will now move into private session. <laughs>